I go out and uh, uh, shake that question box every week, and I thank God when there's not a question. In his <laughs> I hold it up before him, and I shake it. My, it's wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> but whenever you have a question, we can find out the answers. I have some really good people in this class who have a lot of knowledge about um, the uh, Old Testament. Uh, Nora Hallberg, I've told her she's my resource person. I, I talked to her today. I said, you should never go anyplace on Tuesday. When I need to talk to you, I need an answer right now. So, so I don't think that she's going to do that for me. But uh, anyway, but she's wonderful. I'll call her and I'll say, quick, I know it's in there somewhere. I want to know this, 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 and this. And, uh, and, I, and I've got to know this. Could you help me? And three minutes later, she calls back and she'll tell me the, the verses and where it is and add up the people who cross the Red Sea and everything for me. So it's really helpful. So anyway, again, I want to tell you that there are a lot of people here from Half Moon Bay, and I'm really, we're excited about that. We call this, for the Half Moon Bay people, it's called CBSOH, CBS Over the Hill. And uh, so it's sort of your second phase of it. If you ever have anything you would like to share with me, an article or anything that you feel that you read as you're studying or you see in, your, in the newspaper or a magazine, if you want to share it with me, uh, I have a bag. You can always drop things in and uh, cartoons, anything. Anything that really, you, you know, or you've seen someplace. In fact, Gladys Binder, are you here? Is Gladys in here? Oh, I was going to say last week she was going to give me some cartoons, and we lost. But I'd be happy to look at it. I may not be able to use them, but I would be happy. And if you want them returned, be sure and mark them as such that we need to return them to you, and I will. Okay, and now let's briefly just say a few things about uh, a couple of things that I've noticed about studying the Bible every year, and particularly for new people who start or people who are not Christians and as I've said before we have people come to our class who have never owned a Bible ever been to a church that's happened you know that Christianity is only a generation away and if you've come from a family who said that God is dead in the 60s you were not exposed uh, in your home and uh, in going to church and knowing about the Lord Jesus Christ and so uh, sometimes they don't understand where we're beginning in the Bible but we find that we can't play the game of life without any reference to the one who's made the rules and that one is God himself who cared enough to make rules that one of the people in our class said he set the boundaries to keep the evil away from us to keep us safe and that's why he gave us the Ten Commandments and we we are getting a big picture of God this year a really big picture of him we so often think of him just as Jesus Christ and he is Jesus Christ. We think of him as wearing a white robe and wandering around just touching children, and he does that. He does that. And when Jesus was here walking, he did that. But we need to get the big picture of Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And no place do you get that picture like you do in the Old Testament because the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed and all of a sudden it all just comes to life. You begin to see what God was doing in Genesis. There's a story of a little girl who was painting a picture and she was working so hard she was just painting and painting and picking up different colors and she was painting and someone went over to her and they said, what are you doing? And she said, well, I'm painting a picture of God. And the person said, well, you know, no one has ever seen God. They don't even know what he looks like. And they, she said, well, they will when I'm done. <laughs> well, that's what it's like for us. As we're studying the scripture, as we're studying, we will know what he looks like. We will know the fullness of God. And when we start in the beginning of the year, and especially if we're new, and even if we're not new to Bible study, but we're new to Old Testament, we begin and we submit the Bible to us for our criticism. We take the word of God and we say, I am going to critique this. And sometimes that's okay. It's called intellectual pursuit. There's nothing wrong with studying God's word and, and critiquing it. But as we study it, we will find that we will want to submit ourselves to the criticism of the word of God. And that's called spiritual growth. 
And that happens. And if you stick with this class as hard as it is, as difficult as it might seem sometime, you stick with it and you will grow spiritually. And we want to be guided not because by what we think, but by what God says. It's so important to know what God says about everything. Political issues, whatever it is, you want to know what God says. A friend of mine was telling me she's working back in the Midwest, and she went to work the other day, and on the, on the front of her building there was a sign, and she discovered that the people she worked for were very much for something she was against, and she felt God was too. And she said, what am I going to do? And I said, well, I would say quit just you know leave because you're really unequally yoked and she said well I feel that I could have some kind of a witness there she said we got in a big discussion and they said well you can't tell me you feel this way you can't tell me you feel this way and she said well this is really what I feel this is what I think and this is what they feel and this is what they think and when we were done I said you know Bess I said the problem is you'll never win that way you'll never win by saying what you think and what you feel because frankly it doesn't make any difference not really so you want to know so well what God says and so she went back and she called me the next day and she said you know it worked she said I got in another one of those discussions about the same issue and I said well you know it doesn't make any difference what you think or what I think or what I feel or what you feel but it does make a difference what God says that's bottom line and the person said amen it does make a difference. So that's what we're doing. The Bible is going to stretch us. We don't stretch the Bible. The Bible stretches us. And it's everything, every word in there, some way, is for us. I don't know how some of it could be for us, but it is. Because God would not give us something like this if he didn't want us to study it and, and know fully what he's saying. And someone said one time that the Bible is more about more than about getting to heaven because if that's all God wanted to tell us, he could do that with one page or one verse. So he wants us to know the fullness of who he is. So let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for this book, for Deuteronomy, for the whole word of God and for who you are. And Father, we would pray too that you would open our hearts and our minds that we might be receptive to what you have for us personally in this because we know that we're not studying history just we are studying about our lives and mostly we're studying about who you are what kind of a person you really are the holy holy person you are and so we ask you father that you would open our hearts and our minds for that in jesus name we pray amen uh my spiritual gift is doing overheads I'm, I'm losing it because I couldn't I didn't get anything good for you yeah, um, but anyway uh, it's I think it says a lot about what the chapters are about love and obey the one and only God and it's meanwhile back at Mount Nebo and that's for sure we're gonna be at Mount Nebo until Christmas and um, uh, first comes awe then comes love then comes obedience because when you recognize who God is, and this is what Moses is doing there with the Israelites, he wants them to look and see who God is, <gasps> ah, and then you can't help but love him. You cannot help but love him back because you recognize the love he has for you, and you love him back. And as soon as you know who he is, and you know how much he loves you, and you know that he died for you, you know that he lives for you, and you know that he is always at the throne of God praying for you, he is always looking out for you, then you can't help but want to be obedient. And if there are areas in our lives where we are not obedient, we need, I need, we all need to take those areas to God and say, God, I do know who you are. You are who the Word says you are. Your Word yourself who you are. You are the Almighty, the Maker of all things. You are the one that with just the breath of your mouth, your lips, your, your chest, you breathed very life into Adam. You gave me my life. And I want to love you back. And then spend a day loving him back. And then say, Lord, now let's spend this day, this rest of the day, teaching me to be obedient in those areas that I need to be obedient and little by little little by little he will fight the battle for you you will fight it will be a great victory but it will be a victory it'll be a hard victory but it'll be a victory and then 
he asks us to teach his story for future generations. Now he asks this of the Israelites, but he wants it of, by, of us too. And he wants to know, wants us to know too, that we are chosen by him. We were selected by God. We were chosen before the foundation of the world. And that's what he was telling the Israelites, I chose you. I chose you. And then he said, but you need to be separate. Only me. I'm the only God you can have at all. And that's the same thing with us. And we're saved because of God and because of God's love for us, too, and grace. And then the Savior is to come, and we will see. We will talk about the Savior all through the lessons. And one thing I think, it, it's a little scary to say, but I think we need to remember that God is not nice and never claimed to be. He is holy. And we don't know anyone like God except God. So we don't know the difference between holy and nice. But he's not always pleasant, but he is always holy. And so that's very important for us as we study. So let's begin at the Mount Nebo, and we'll see if you'll open to Deuteronomy 6. These are the commands, and we're going to quickly run through a few of these. Uh, Moses instructs the Israelites. This is the last month of his life. He is going to die at the end of Deuteronomy, we will have a great celebration for him. And uh, these are the commands. He says that Lord your God directed me, Moses, to teach you. And he says you are going to cross the Jordan. That's a nice promise, isn't it, for them to know. Because do you know that for 38 years they've been wandering around waiting for all the rest of the people 20 years and older to die. And they're standing there. And I think if I were one of those people, I would say, Moses, let's make this short. I want to get in. I don't want to stand out here because one of us is bound to sin. And God may say, whoops, you're not going in now for another 40 years until you all die off. Because that's exactly what they saw happening. You know, can you imagine them wandering around the desert? Can you imagine them wandering around when the one person would die, they'd say, there goes another one. Because they were anxious, I'm sure, to get over and go into the Holy Land, get promised land. It's not the Holy Land, it's the promised land. Okay, and so he said, you will get into the land, and when you get there, your enjoyment will depend upon your obedience. You could get there and not enjoy it because you want to have a quality of life, not just a quantity, a, a quantity of life. You want to live long, but you want those days to count for something. I was talking to someone about my husband having some heart surgery just a, 20 minutes or so ago, and, and one of the reasons he had the heart surgery was because he said, I want quality of life. He said, I don't mind dying at the time he was 60 or so, 61. He said, I, I don't mind dying. I'm ready to go. But he said, if I'm going to live, I want quality of life. Well, as a Christian, our quality of life is knowing the Savior and following him. And so this is what God wants for him. That's why Moses said, you're going to enjoy your life. And then he says, hear, O Israel. And he's talking to the whole nation. Now, we know there are 601,000 and then a few more hundred men only there and we don't know how many women and children and so on but he says hear O nation Israel be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey now tell me the truth don't you think that sounds real good to them I mean they have had manna and manna for 40 years and to them they think this is like dying and going to heaven this is really like dying and going to heaven and, and so he says first of all the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is very important. Hear, O Israel. This is part of the prayer that the, that the Jewish people say two or three times a day. It's called the Shema, right? Shema, Shema. And hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And they want them to know that he will be the only one. Now, we know him as the three in one, but he is one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit cannot be separated. We do not worship one and not the other. They are all one. And the reason we know that it is three in one is because God's word itself throughout Scripture ties them together. They are all one and the same. It's not something that we just made up to fit a doctrine that we like. And so he says, love the Lord your God, love him back. Love him back with all your soul, with all your heart, and with all your strength. And that means completely and wholly. And you know when you determine that you will do something, 
your emotions will follow. I, I want to tell you that in almost everything. When you make up your mind, you tell your emotions to get in line. If you're having trouble with your husband, if you're having trouble with your marriage, if you have not determined that you are going to make it, your emotions will run wild. So you just need to say, emotions, I have no part of it. I am willing to do this. I'm willing to make my marriage work because I know that it's pleasing unto God. I'm willing to be supportive of my pastor even though I may not agree with him on things because I, it's pleasing unto God. The things we do need to be pleasing unto God. And pleasing and saving your marriage is most certainly pleasing unto God. Okay, these commandments I give to you, they are to be written upon your hearts. And you know, the things that you have upon your heart are really important. If you look at your heart and say, what is there? You know, it's what you're doing. It's where you're going. If, uh, if you're interested in only one thing, it's going to be on your heart. And so you want to say, I want God to be written. I want his law, his rules, all to be written upon my heart. Because a heart full of treasure will leave very little room for junk. You want treasure in your heart. And he says, now impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Now that means impress them. That means that's a job for you. And it should be natural as breathing. Every morning when you get up, it should be natural. I, someone said to me, they liked it when I said, um, say to your child, God has a big plan for you every day, every single day. Do you know every conversation in our homes, everyone should be, now I'm not saying I do this, but I want to. Let's be willing to do it. But every single conversation in your home, can be an ordinary conversation about an extraordinary God with your children in the morning. You know what I said to my husband this morning? He sat alongside the bed and I said, what's God going to do in your life today? And he said, everything, I hope, because I don't know how to do it. Extraordinary God, all the time. So you want to do this with your children. I took some notes about, and I, it's pretty close, uh, how many hours you spend with your children. And since we have a lot of young mothers, let's really talk at this. But think about it. Put anyone in. Uh, you have 30 hours of school a week for children. Is that close? Is that close? Anyone has children? Give or take. Okay. Uh, one or two hours of Sunday school. And it doesn't say, incidentally, for the school to impress this upon your children. And it also does not say for Sunday schools, too. Uh, Bible study. What are they here? Two hours? Well, they're going to do a good job. But they weren't told to do it. You were told to do it. 56 hours of sleep for your children. That's kind of low, I hope. I hope your children are sleeping longer than that. But that would mean, if those were close, that would mean that you would have about 70 hours a week with your children. And um, that's not very much. Because in that 70 hours, you've got a lot to do, too. You're feeding him, and you're cooking, and you're doing some washing and doing some dinner and maybe doing some other things with him. But in that time, when they are sitting and when they are rising up and when they're lying down, keep that flow. Can I tell you, may I tell you, that I would give everything I have to go back and be able to do that, raising my children. Don't miss it. Don't miss talking about God all the time. And you know, sometimes I'm so happy about some of you who don't work. It's, it's so incredible because, you know, I think about some of the people out working and scrounging and saving to give something. They're going to pass that on to their children. And what they need to pass on is what
what God will give you to pass on. Now, I know some of you have to work in this area, and I want to tell you, I, I think you almost have to, don't you? I mean, it's a tough area to live in. But milk those hours. Ask God to stretch your time and increase your time. And when you're driving a carpool, keep your radio off. Don't ever play your radio unless you're singing some songs with the children and spend some time. Then it says tie them as symbols on your hands, your forehead. When you're teaching, God has a plan for you. Talk about it all the time. Write them on your door frames of your houses. And I went through our house, and I just thought it was kind of fun to, to see about this because, you know, we don't do it the way they did it at that time with the little phylacteries and wearing them on their hands and their foreheads and little boxes. But we still, as Christians, buy little plaques and little things that we have around. And at the side of my bed, the last thing when I turn off my light, I have a little picture that says, As the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for thee, O Lord. And it's really sweet. I see that. Now, I see it even if I don't read it. I mean, I'm ministering almost really to my spirit. On the other side of the bed, my husband has a little picture. It says, down low, right under the light so you can see it. You won't see it if you walk in the room. We are the people and the sheep of his pasture. It's important for him to have that verse. That's an important verse. And then in my bathroom, and I love to tell this because uh, there's a, I have a picture. Do you, some of you know what it is? Some of you, any one of you, um, it's a it's a it's a peach colored picture that I had framed, and it was given to me by the young mothers class one year, and it says, uh, "As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord." And that and so when we bought this house five years, four years ago, we I did the bathroom to go with that picture. So I see that all the time, and it's not only do I see it there, but it reflects in the mirrors, and it's almost like it's saying, don't forget this, don't forget this. But the, And my dining room is filled. You know what, well, you have things like this, but you know something? That you can have them pasted on the ceiling, you can have them pasted on the walls, on the bottom of your feet, inside your nightgown, and if it's not in your heart, it's not going to make any difference. And in fact, you'll get used to it. You'll get used to seeing those things, and it won't be any more than you know when to stop at a stoplight, don't you? You know when to stop at a stop sign. You don't have to look anymore. You don't even have to look when you're driving. You know what you're doing. You think, how did I get here? I didn't even watch. Well, we don't want our Christian life to be that way. We want to look at those pictures and cherish them and read them. And when we go through, read them and keep the scripture out there. When the Lord, your God brings you into the land he swore to you to your fathers to abraham to isaac and to jacob to give you a land with large cities i, I wrote this from another version i love it because it's so poetic it's almost like a waltz it's just beautiful he will give you great and good cities which you did not build and houses filled with every good thing which you did not fill and hewn cisterns which you did not hew Vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant, then you shall eat and you shall be satisfied. He'll give it all. Is that beautiful? Isn't it incredible how beautiful the scripture is? Now, this is Deuteronomy. This is not the Psalms that you always think are beautiful. It's beautiful. Be careful. And then he says, there are some perils, however. Three perils, I counted. Probably a bunch more. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord. Don't forget. When you get in and he gives you these cisterns that you did not hew and gives you the houses that you did not build and he gives you everything, don't forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You know, we as Christians need to always remember that he brought us out of slavery too. He brought us out to bring us in. Just, that's what Deuteronomy is all about bringing us out to bring us in. Peril number two is verse 14. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. Don't do that. God is holy. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and he is jealous not of you. He doesn't have to be jealous of you. He is jealous for you. He is zealous for you. He loves you. He has given everything for you. And it always amazes me, and this will show you how deep my, I am spiritually, I'm always amazed that God just didn't start all over. Again and again and again. But that's not the way God did it. He made a commitment to these people, knowing in the beginning that they would fail him. 
making a plan so that he could still have them because he had chosen to love them. Parallel number three says, do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massa. And that was where they wanted water. It's in Exodus 17. They wanted water and they wanted water and they wanted water now. Like Veruca Salt in, what is that, Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory or Charlie? I want it and I want it now. And they said, they dared to say this, is the Lord among us or not? Because we didn't get what we wanted when we wanted it. Now, God doesn't like that. He never goes out to lunch. Whatever's happening in your life, he has not gone to lunch. He is there. He is holy. And we need to know that even when our prayers are not answered, and many of us have prayers that aren't answered the way we want them. I mean, if I had prayers that were answered the way I want them, I would have Joanne Evans figure. I would... I wouldn't have had the battle with cancer as she had, but I would be t- tall and thin and gorgeous. I mean, I mean I've, I've actually prayed that. Uh, but prayer is not getting man's will done on earth, but it's getting God, uh, God's worth work done here on earth. We want God's work done here. That's why we pray. And we need to ask God to even teach us how to pray. I mean, the things I pray for sometimes. First of all, I have to pray for everybody to be safe in my family because when they're not, I'm just terribly distracted. And if there's an argument going on, I can hardly stand it. And I, everything, and I pray for those things to get those out of the way. But then I need to learn to pray. And I get so ahead of God. You can ask anyone who works with me. I mean, they practically have to tie me down. I mean, I get these ideas and I'm out front. God's somewhere behind me. And the rest of the people are back behind God saying, would you bring her back so we can have a little meeting about this? And I say, oh, but I've got this great idea. I was talking to Joanne Evans. Raise your hand so they at least know who you are. Everybody doesn't know who you are. She's our senior leader. And I was talking to her yesterday, and, and I said, oh, isn't this a great idea? And she said, just cool it. Just give it some time. And I said, oh, play with me, Joanne. Play with me. This is such a good idea. But she's more serious, and it's good. We need somebody around here who's serious. So verse uh, uh, 20 says, um, in the future, when your son asks, oh, no, let's go back up to 19, because I think this is good for all of us, thrusting out all of your enemies before you, the Lord has asked him to do. And an enemy is anyone, anything, any place that gets between you and God. Anything. Get rid of them. If you, and you'll know them. You know what? Nobody else knows them. You don't know. You don't know the enemies I have. You all don't know me well enough, a few of you do, to know some of the things that get between me and God. And I'm not even going to tell you about it because I don't want you to know about it. But anyway, but get rid of those enemies and ask God to help you. Say, Lord, God, Lord Jesus Christ, will you help me knock these things off little by little by little? That was a wonderful verse in the lesson. Little by little by little. In the future, when your son asks you, and always be prepared for this, what is the meaning of all of your laws? What is the meaning of this? Be ready to tell him. Be ready to tell them what God has done. And in this particular case, the story that they need to tell is that we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt and we experienced his power. We experienced his power. He came in and he brought us out. And before our very eyes, verse 22, we saw the miracles. And keep it alive. Keep it alive. Keep it so exciting that the people are excited, that they really want to know about this. And he brought us out from there to bring us in, and then he did it for our good only. Be sure and tell them that God wasn't just trying to get his own way. He wanted what was best for you, which incidentally is his way. That's why he wants obedience for you and righteousness. Because it is the best you can have. The very best you can have. And, and with your own story, get so you know, so that you can share with a person what God has done with your life. Be able to share it. Practice it with a friend. Sit down, two of you together, and say, tell me about how your life is different now that God is coming. Get so excited. What? What? Oh, the newspaper office? Oh, okay. Uh, I was telling Shelly about this the other day. Uh, Shelly's my daughter in love. And, uh, but um, uh, years ago, I drove a carpool to um, a newspaper office uh, with school. And uh, I wasn't a Christian then, so we didn't talk about the Lord. Uh, but um, 
I, I probably had a Volkswagen bus at the time because we had seven children and some dogs and all that stuff, so we had the biggest thing you could have at the time. And um, I, we were waiting outside the newspaper office for the other children to come out, and um, I said, you know, I loved it. I said, I, I just loved it. I've never been to a newspaper office before. And uh, they said, you've never been to a newspaper office? No. And I said, well, what did you do when you were a kid? And I said, well, we didn't go to newspaper offices and things like that because when I was your age, it was during the war. I was born in 1932. I'm 60. I can still hardly get used to this. <laughs> Be still my heart. Okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> but anyway, so so when I was when I was your age, I was in the war during the war, and you won't, first of all, you only had one car. If you had two cars, you didn't drive them. You put them up on blocks, and you had these little tickets and and in the window that said A B C. Does anyone here remember this? Hardly. Put hands down. You've given away your age. You read it. You read it. <laughs> and these little stickers in the in the corner of your car, and it was A, B, or C. And if you had a if you had a job where you were necessary for defense, you got more gas. And if you just drove for, you didn't get very much gas anyway. And they were really impressed with that. And then I said, Well, do you know? I said we only had two pair of shoes a year. Isn't that right? We had little little books. We have to get together and have lunch, Helen. We can have a club. And and you and then you had five pounds of sugar. Yes, I'm going to do five pounds of sugar, I think, a month. So, And that was a family. And you, that wasn't very much sugar because then, I mean, you did use more sugar. And uh, at the end of the month, if you had any sugar left over, you could make fudge. Oh, what a great thing. But there was no chocolate. So you made peanut butter fudge, which always stuck. And you burned it. See, oh, reminiscent, huh? And then and there was no chocolate any place. Everything was on a ship somewhere or, you know, off with, with, with the people in the service. And, and then everything, uh, I think we had whorehound bars, which were like cough drops. That was candy. I mean, you go in and buy little whorehound bars, and they, were, they still are awful. Oh. And then sometimes they had lemon drops. They had a little sugar. I'm sorry, I was telling these children as well. They, I mean, they're amazed. I mean, they had no idea that there was a world without Hershey bars. I mean, or popsicles or whatever they were into. I mean, they could not believe that. And then I told them about collecting gas or uh, grease. You had to collect grease for, you didn't have to, but if you were patriotic, you did. And, you know, you did sang songs like, he's my uncle, I'm his nephew, and all these wonderful things. And you saluted all the time, and you cried every time there was anything patriotic. You were very, very American. And then we took, uh, we picked the grease up every other Saturday morning, which we would take off to the Girl Scout Little House. And when you picked it up, it was ice cold. And it was great. But by noon, when you got to the Girl Scout Little House or to the Brownies or wherever you were taking it, it had melted, and it was so nauseating. I mean, you just wanted to barf. It was so awful. And then the other week, you would pick up newspapers, and you would collect these newspapers. Well, the interesting thing about it was but these kids loved hearing about that. And meat, oh, they, we had, you know, stamps for meat. And then you got tokens back if you didn't spend all your stamps because it wasn't very much meat anyway. I mean, you could have time to be a vegetarian was during World War II. What? Meat was, meat was Tuesday. Oh, yes, everything. Yeah. So I told these children all about this. And it was really interesting. But when I got a letter from the teacher, and she said, uh, our children, we want to thank you for driving for us. And when the children returned, I asked them to all write a story on what it was like visiting the newspaper office. And she said, and all of the students in the class wrote about that, except for the people who wrote in your car. And enclosed are the stories they wrote about World War II and Reichman. <laughs> but do you know, do you want to know, isn't, isn't that in incredible, though, to think that you've got to keep those stories alive. Now, if they heard that on Edward R. Murrow, I don't think they would be nearly as impressed as another person speaking it. And now, I, I need to tell my children, my children. Now, Shelly is going to tell. You're always going to keep that alive, aren't you? you got to tell about Grandma. used to only get two pair of shoes and a, a year. You've got to keep that going. So, okay, let's turn now. And let's turn. <laughs> Meanwhile, now we've got to go in and fight seven nations in seven minutes. Okay, when... <laughs> There was a great cost of survival for these people because they had been called to separation. Moses is getting them ready. He says, we're going to go in there. Now, all scripture, all scripture is written for us, but not all scripture is written to us. And I think some of you found that out because we don't do the wars quite the same way because, incidentally, uh, God called this war into being, right? Big difference when God sets a war into being than when man sets a war into being. Man usually is thinking of greed. God was thinking of protecting his people.
people, protecting his people. And so Moses said, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, there are going to be these seven wicked tribes, seven wicked groups of countries, and you need to wipe them out. Now the sin has reached its full measure uh, four, uh, way back with Abraham, which is now hundreds and hundreds of years ago, in Genesis 15. God had told Genesis when he gave him the land, when he told him about his people and how he was going to increase the numbers, he said there will be a time when you will leave this land and, while, and you will be gone and that land, while you're away, the iniquity, the sin of those people will be full. Will be full. Now, 450 years uh, since they've been over in uh, Egypt, remember, from here to here. Now it's about 470 now because of the time they've been in the desert. God has given the people in Canaan, he has given them all the time to repent. He has given them. Now, he knew they wouldn't. You know that. God wasn't sitting thinking, will they repent? Won't they repent? He knew they wouldn't. But he wants us to see his patience. He gave them all the time they needed to turn from wickedness. He gives us all the time we need. But there will be a day and there will be a time when we refuse to turn from wickedness that God will deal with us. He will deal with us. And he said, this war is not going to be a good thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. I don't even know that you call it holy. I guess it is to go in and exterminate people. But he said, there will be no moderation. You will not waver. You are going to go in and destroy these people totally. Now, they didn't. We find that out later in Judges, that they didn't do it. But these people were not like um, people you know in the news. The people in Canaan at the time were offering their children a sacrifice. There was such sexual perversion that they say that some of it can, can't even be written. It is so bad, the things that archaeologists have discovered. But there was a god of Moloch, and they would start the fire in this god, and they would drop their babies in his mouth, and they would go down and burn. They would sacrifice animals, of course. Animals are always sacrificed before you sacrifice humans, but, but, they, but they would sacrifice the animals. Then they would tell fortunes by taking the innards of the animals, the entrails of the animals, and tell fortunes. I mean, it's just truly awful. And historically, uh, archaeologists say uh, that the Canaan, Canaanites worship was just hideous, just hideous. And so this is what they're doing there. And God says, when you get there, you can't mix with them. You cannot be part of them. And if you leave any, and if you marry, and if your sons marry their daughters, and if your daughters marry their sons, then what will happen? Verse 4, and it's an incredible verse, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger then will burn against you. And I love you, 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 and I don't want you to turn from me. I don't want you to go to other gods. I don't want you to let anything be in your life that you would not want reproduced in your children's life. Because God is doing a great thing because in this family, in one of these families, the line of Judah, there will come the Savior for all mankind, the one who will save all men for God's presence. And he said, utterly hate and destroy and get rid of the idols and get rid of the altars and go in and get rid in that land of all that will threaten God's people. Levina Roski, I think, was saying in her core group today, uh, this came to me, that she was in the, were you, were you in the waves? waves and tell what the rule was for the for the wars then that they were not they were never to destroy the idols or anything because it was bad for their culture it was bad for their culture you know we're we're kind of like that today too we we one of our unforgivable sins has become intolerance did you notice that that's not true i mean we should never tolerate sin never and we hear this one saying, and sayings don't save us, I'm glad for that, but we hear this one saying that says, hate the sin but love the sinner, and that's true, that's what God does. But do you know sometimes, as you're loving the sinner, you're responsible for God, before God, to let him know what's going to happen to them. Don't be so tolerant that you prop the door of hell open for people. 
and walk away and think, well, after all, each to his own. And yet there has to be that fine line where you don't jump down someone's throat and tell them that they're going to die and go to hell if they don't do it your way. But somehow pray that God will show you for the people, incidentally, that he will bring into your path. Not my path. But there are people he's going to bring into your life that you are like that little waif that we talked about. Or you're like that person that God just planted there and say, God, it is so important for me to know what to say to this person, how to bring them close to you, how to, bring, how to live a life that is pleasing to you and that they can see that I have pleased you and that they will want you and they will see that the power in my life is an extraordinary power because I have an extraordinary God, that I'm not an ordinary person. And find a way that God will show you in your life so that you can be serving him by leading people to him. Um, the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because there were a lot of you, not because you were cute, not just because you were lovable. He chose you because he loved you. We don't understand the mystery of love, do we? We don't understand why a person falls in love. But he said, I love you. And it was an oath he made to their fathers and to their forefathers. And he said, I will save you. I will redeem you. These next verses, we're going to have to end, but the next verses say there are two kinds. There are really two kinds of, peop of, of people. There are people who love God or people who hate God. You can't just say, well, I guess he's all right. Well, he's okay for some people. You either say, I love God or I hate him. I love him or I hate him. You know, that is our choice. God has said, uh, the devil has cast a vote for all of us. And God cast a vote for us. And we're registered to vote. But we are the only person who can cast that final vote and determine whether we love him or hate him. No one else can do that for us. And those are choices that we're going to have to make this year. We're going to have to end. Oh, and there's so much good things in this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that giants fall hard and that they can fall very quickly because you can just, with your breath, just knock them down. And that all of us have giants in our lives. We have people, we have things that are happening to us that seem almost insurmountable. And I guess, Father, that's because we are, we are small. But we need to trust you as the God who will, little by little, deliver us. Father, you are sovereign, and we want to tell you today that we want you, a sovereign God, to be our God. We want to thank you that you made an opening for us to come to you because of your love for us, that you have brought us out of the darkness and into the light, and that you've given us the Savior, that you've given us the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit will live in us when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will live in us, and he will tell us when we're saying something wrong, and he will, he will nudge us, he will let us know that the things we are doing are not pleasing in your sight. Oh, Father, let us be sensitive to that. And Father, too, if there is anyone here in this room today who has not dealt with receiving you as their Lord and their Savior, Father, I would pray that you would begin a great work in them, and uh, that um, before this day is out, they would be on their knees before you, saying, I want you, you sovereign, awesome God, to be mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.